Hi, this is Dave from Steel City Jones Flight Academy. In today's video, we're talking about the Zenmoose L1 camera sensor. Now, as most of you already know, the L1 camera sensor has been out for quite some time. And we've got a lot of requests of do a video on the L1. Where's your video? Where's your video? Well, the problem is very simple. It's supply and demand. We cannot keep up with these. Nobody can. And they go straight to customers. They're highly in demand. But let's go ahead and talk about some of the specifics about the L1, some of the features, some of the limitations, and some of the things that you're going to want to know in case you are considering one of these aircraft. This has a Livex module inside it and a very high precision IMU sensor. There's also a one inch CMOS 20 megapixel camera sensor in here as well. So what is the second sensor for? Well, we can use, this is a very versatile camera sensor. We can use this for LiDAR mapping as well as traditional photogrammetry. Now that comes in handy if you don't have a budget to have an L1 and a P1 at the same time. This does both very well. Now let's put it in perspective because the P1 camera sensor is a 48 megapixel camera full frame so that has that's that has all the bells and whistles that you possibly would need you can achieve any gsd at any flight height this is a fixed camera and it is what it is but it does it very well it is a high grade survey grade sensor on here as well so we can do both types of flight missions on here so in addition to doing autonomous flights we can go ahead and do manual flights in the same manner for type of flight missions that are not the most effective way to do grid mapping, such as long, tall buildings like we're going to show you. Once we hit record, we can see the live data coming off the sensor in real time. We can also hit the preview button, which will give us a full 3D rendering of the point cloud in real time as we go. We can take our fingers and rotate the cloud to get a full three-dimensional view as we need it. Now, let's talk about accuracy in a generalized term. Accuracy means different things to different people. It's also a very vague term. So there are different levels and different terms of accuracy that we have to think about. And we gotta look at what's called ranging accuracy as well as system accuracy because those are all going to both affect the overall absolute accuracy of your project. Now, what do I mean by all this? So let's take one step at a time. We can have a ranging accuracy of up to three centimeters at 100 meters away in that range. This has up to 450 meters up at 80% reflectivity and 190 meters at 10% reflectivity. So what does that mean? Objects that are more reflective are going to have a better detection range where you can have the drone further away and be able to detect it very well. And the less reflective it is, the drone will then have to be closer up to its focal areas. I would consider it to be like thin branches where all the leaves are off the trees are not going to be very reflective compared to, let's say, a building structure. Next is the system accuracy. What is system accuracy? Well, that's going to take into all of your individual components in your system that can have an influence over your overall project accuracy. So for example, your actual camera sensor here has a high precision IMU sensor in here. If we don't calibrate the IMU like we're supposed to, then that's going to affect the overall system accuracy. Using the RTK system, it is a prerequisite for LiDAR mapping that we're using RTK so that we're going to have a lot more tighter control over our flights. So as a reminder, the RTK system, when the RTK system is engaged and we have RTK service, the aircraft will fly tighter and the aircraft will actually have a much tighter on the Z axis for how it flies. Then there's the terrain following part of this. We can engage terrain following and have the aircraft stay at a designated altitude above our flight line. That's going to increase our vertical accuracy significantly. Is our base station tight? 
are we actually going ahead and referencing the base station to a very good checkpoint that and how well is that checkpoint how was that shot the survey tech when we're actually putting the down rod directly right on top of our known point how close and exact is that are we putting that over that known point the speed that it's written to the card the delay the calibration of the right speed so a lot of things come into the system accuracy but DJI gives us an overall generalized view of what we should see and that is an overall system accuracy spec that they're giving us so if you have purchased your L1 camera or are you considering getting the L1 camera with the hopes that you're going to get anywhere between one, two, three centimeters of accuracy in your project, it's not going to happen. Even the top line, the, the best of the best LiDAR systems out there that cost anywhere from eighty dollars to $100,000, you're going to be pressed to see anything better than two to three centimeters of accuracy. If you need that type of accuracy, then you're better off doing photogrammetry using like a P1 camera sensor with RTK and even go beyond and set up ground control points if you really need the tightest of the tight accuracies. You might be saying to yourself, if LiDAR is not as accurate as photogrammetry, then why are we using this? Well, LiDAR has definitely a place in space in the area out there and that is really trying to go through vegetation and be able to get a lot better cloud-based and a better 3D model of that vegetation where photogrammetry doesn't do that very well. If you're familiar with photogrammetry, you know, a lot of people recommend that we do all of our flight mapping when the leaves are off the trees so that we can get the best resolution out of that vegetation area. And even when we do that, it's very limited at best. So LiDAR gives us a lot better resolution, better penetration for being able to do in those type of applications. That's where this shines. When we do the mission planning, we want to take a lot of things into consideration, such as the speed of the copter, the number of rows that we have to use, the length of the rows, because we have a lot of calibration issues that we want to potentially really avoid if at all costs. Now, let's move to the data acquisition phase of the workflow. What type of RTK service are we going to use? Are we going to use NTRIP or the DRTK base station? This is when we get on site. This is where we're going to make sure that our RTK service is good, that we're make sure that all the coordination system is calibrated. If we're using the DRTK base station, are we setting those coordinates to a known point? All that workflow has to be done first. If we fly the mission without RTK service, it is not going to process. And if we have RTK service, let's say we have N-trip service, and that N-trip service gets interrupted in the middle of a flight without your knowing about it, that flight is not gonna be usable. So you wanna take that into consideration when you're doing this. Again, we have two different ways to do RTK service. I did all the flight missions and everything through the DRTK base station. So once we fly the mission and collect the data, we're then going to go ahead and process that data. We have to use DGI Terra to bring that data in because it is proprietary files that cannot work with any other software. So we have to have the DGI Terra. Now, when you buy your L1, you're going to get this card right here, which is a six month subscription to the DJI Terra electricity model. This is good for six months. You have a little scratch pad over here for your activation code, and this will get you six months for free. But again, that is gonna run out. So make sure if you haven't purchased your L1 yet, you're considering getting this, make sure you're gonna budget for after the initial six months and look at the costs that are associated with this because there are different models and there's different plans for DJI Terra. So we're going to bring our data in and then we're going to create an overall point cloud and an LIS model to be able to look over. Now DGI Terra is a very basic stripped down way to look at our data. It allows us to be able to do simple measurements, calculations, volumes and areas. 
but we're going to want to go ahead and really take a look at using another system to be able to analyze that data going forth, which is the fourth stage of our workflow. There are many different software options for you to be able to go ahead and bring your data in to analyze it. We have Rock Robotics and LiDAR 360. These are just two examples of LiDAR processing software. There's more than a dozen viable options out there. Once we bring that data into one of those programs, we're gonna be able to take the LIS output file and really go and look at control point accuracy assessments, denoise the data, and really look at digital elevation models and a lot more that we can do with that data. So that's a little bit about this LiDAR camera sensor. We've flown many missions with it. We have a lot of data inside our Matrice 300 online course, where we actually go over all the features and functionality, the workflow processes. We go over and how to be able to create the flight missions and process the data into Terra. So if you're interested in that, see our video or our online course through the website. We have a brand new website coming out. It's gonna hit right around the beginning of February. You can get a lot more information on our website as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them down in a section below. We'll be glad to help and to have a conversation with you, or you can contact us directly. Any which way we can help, we'll be glad to do so. So thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. We'll talk to you soon.